Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. As the children are going, please turn to Judges, the sixth chapter. Continuing on in our series in the book of Judges, we come to the fifth judge in the book, actually the second one for us. We're going to be looking at, as we looked at Deborah last week, we look at Gideon this week. We'll come to uh, Jephthah and then Samson. Uh, We've got a couple weeks, though, on Gideon this week and next week. Judges chapter 6. Listen to the word of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you've not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. And put us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel. Out of Midian's hand, am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and, I will, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah, a flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat, the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizrites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a longer passage, but uh, when we're going through Judges, we're, we're trying to get the, the context together for it. And Like I said, this is the fifth judge in the book of Judges, the second one that we've taken a look at. And as I said, we're going to look at Jephthah uh, after we're done with Gideon this week and next week. And we're going to look at Samson, stories that are probably familiar to us. When the angel of the Lord visited Gideon and told him that he was going to be the judge to save the Israelites from the oppression of the Midianites, Gideon asked for a sign. He said, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. What God was asking Gideon to do was big. Gideon lacked the confidence to do what the Lord asked, wouldn't you? Do you imagine? We, we see that the... Uh, the um, Midianites had come into the land and taken it over from top to bottom. How in the world could a small tribe of Israel, let alone a weakest of the smallest tribe, take care of this matter? But the Lord came to him and said, you're going to do this, Gideon. 
And Gideon lacked the confidence. And so he kept asking for signs. And God gave Gideon several of them. An angel of the Lord came and took the sacrifice and touched it. And fire came from the rock and it disappeared. That was a sign. As soon as the angel left, then when Gideon said, Oh no, what am I going to do? A voice from heaven, another sign spoke to him. And said, Peace. Don't worry. Do not be afraid. We've already seen that in the Bible, the, word, the phrase, do not be afraid, is there uh, 365 times. That's once for every day of the year. That was one of them there. What do you think the message is from God? Don't be afraid. Well, Gideon was afraid, and so God gave him more signs. We'll see in, in part of the story that, that Gideon will take fleece and put it on the ground, and God will put dew on it one night and have dew not on it another. And so signs were a part of Gideon's life because of his insecurity and fearfulness. And God does provide signs to us on occasion. Have you ever lacked confidence in what God asked you to do? Has God ever given you a sign? How did it come? How did you know that God wanted you to move forward in a certain direction in your life? Sometimes we don't get signs. And sometimes we live in unclarity or with with a lack of clarity. And that's okay because that's part of the faith too, isn't it? Once in a while, though, God does provide things for us, encouragement, signs to move forward in a certain direction. We've been here, the Purdy family now, Kathy and I and the kids, have been here uh, 16 and a half years in Burbank, and it's been wonderful. uh, 17 years ago, though, as we were on our knees praying, we sensed God was calling us to another place, to another direction, that there was something the Lord wanted us to do. And then we had a call from uh, Mr. Richard Hill here at Burbank, and uh, we had uh, met the people of this church and knew that this is where we were supposed to be, that's that's where God is leading us to. And we were very confident about it. We could sense God's leading to Burbank. But one Sunday, I, I got up to tell the people of Lake Arrowhead, people that we loved and still love, people that were very meaningful in our lives, part of our family, and, and we being a part of their family, I stood up in the pulpit to let them know that we were leaving. This was the news to the congregation. Now, the elders had heard about that because we had prayed with them uh, before this time, but I'll never forget uh, standing up in the pulpit and just weeping and just crying and and crying with people after the service after we let them know we're moving to another place because this is where the Lord's leading us. And I'll never forget a woman in the service who came up to me afterwards and she was shaking, she was angry, and she said, no, no. This is not God's will for your life. You're not hearing from God, right? And I said, well, I I think we are. But, you know, let's pray. And she said, well, I'm going to pray about it this week because I want to know that you're making the right decision. And I'm going to ask God for a sign. Well, the next week came and she came up to me and she said, Ross, I asked God for a sign. And uh, here's the sign I asked him, and she laughed. She said, if, God, if Ross is moving away, is, is your direction God, then here's the sign. She said, on the day or right around the time you leave, there'll be a great snowstorm, and she laughed. Living in Lake Arrowhead, we had gone through a long period of drought with no snow, and it wasn't forecasted for quite a while. The day before we left, there was a snowstorm. The worst in 17 years. So bad was the snowstorm that two plows had come. A plow had come and broken down, couldn't get us out. Another plow had come and couldn't plow the road in front of our house. And I remember Kathy and I uh, got the kids together and and got them ready and took all of our belongings and put them on sleds and began walking through the snowdrifts to the ranger station so someone could bring us up so we could be here on Sunday morning to make sure that we were getting here. And I remember coming into Lake, uh, to Burbank and just being soaked from head to foot and thinking, wow, that was quite an adventure. Now, I don't believe that God changed the weather patterns for the woman who was struggling with her feelings of God's will and giving her a sign, but I do believe that the Lord may have prompted her in her heart to pray for that thing for a sign so that she would be convinced because she was very upset. She'd come to know the Lord through our ministry. She didn't know him before, and so I represented, I think, to her sort of like a father to her. I saw her a year later walking in the village of Lake Arrowhead and I looked and she looked at me and she smiled and I thought, "Uh uh-oh. She came up to me and she smiled big, just ear to ear and she said, Ross, I guess you were supposed to go to Burbank, weren't you? I said, yeah. 
Now, that was a moment of a sign that I remember in my mind, a sign for a woman who needed affirmation in her life. It's my firm contention that the Lord doesn't want us wandering around aimlessly or in confusion. Now, again, I don't think the life of faith always provides clarity for us, and there's something in the lack of clarity that teaches us to depend in God, on God. But once in a while, God does give us a sign or an affirmation. And, 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 and if we call upon the Lord and ask for the Lord, Lord, I, I'm just not sure. I need a little bit more affirmation that God comes through and God provides a sign. I know that in my life, there have been moments where I've prayed for something and said, God, I, I just don't know what to do. And, and, and then maybe in the, the, the moment or that day or in the following days as I'm praying about it, a person will come up and say something to me out of the blue in which I'll go, that's exactly what I needed to hear. God provides signs for us. And our passage today begins by telling us things that we know. Gideon struggled with God. He didn't know what to do and he couldn't believe what God was asking him to do. Our passage begins by telling us that the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midianites. Boy, that just goes back to the themes we've been going through now for the past couple of weeks. The cycle of sin. They did evil, and they strayed from God. They were into sin, slavery. They cried out, and God provided a Savior who saved them. Midian was an undefined region in the southern desert. The Midianites, they're related to the Hebrews through Abraham and his wife Keturah, Genesis 25. The Midianites are descendants of Abraham. They're, they're related to the Jews, but at the time of Gideon, they're oppressing the Jewish people, the Israelites. They traveled through the land and they took over until they pillaged the land piece by piece. In fact, what we read in the scriptures is how they came in as a swarm of locusts. They pillaged everything. The Midianites would stop at the farms of the Israelites and live there for a time until their crops and produce were gone. And then when they were, if there was something remaining, they destroyed it. They destroyed their animals and their livestock just to be mean, just because they were evil. And what made the Midianites so strong is that they rode camels. This is the first time in history, we just read it here, the first time in history that we see organized camel raids and it's through the Midianites. And it's no wonder the people of Israel were frightened. There was no known defense against the camels and Midianites, uh, the warfare of the Midianites. The camels then would later on in history turn into the chariots of old. Nowadays, we might call them, you know, the tanks might be the big arm. But in those days, could you imagine being a farmer and looking up to see camels with men with swords? How would you defend yourself? Or even imagine this, if you were an Israelite for a moment, imagine this, spending months preparing your harvest, getting up early every day and, and going out to take care of your fields day after day, month after month, and all of a sudden, just at the moment, the crops begin to come up and you say, oh God, thank you so much. Now we're going to survive because in the ancient world, if your crops didn't come up, you die. And you get to the moment where the crops come up and just as you're about to celebrate, you look up to see the camels and the Midianites come in and going, good, we've been waiting for this moment. Wouldn't you be frightened? The people hid to save their lives. As we learn in the text, they hid in caves. They hid in shelters. We may not know all the reasons why the Midianites came to invade the land with such cruelty, but we do know theologically what was happening. We know that Israel strayed from God. In verses 7 to 10, we read about a prophet that came to the children of Israel to rebuke them for their fear. We also learn in the passage that there are, in Israel, there are idols that are set up to ba Baal and to Ashtoreth, the gods of fertility and sexuality. In other words, the people of God who worship Yahweh now had statues in their fields and their, in their homes of these fertility gods and goddesses. And we see the cycle that we learned and we've covered the last several weeks that as Israel began to stray, they became sinful. And as they entered sin, then they became slaved or enslaved and oppressed. And as they were oppressed, they cried out to God and God would deliver them. In our case, we see that God selected a savior whose name is Gideon. 
who was from the least of the tribes and the least. He was the least of that tribe. Isn't that the way God works? God doesn't look on the outward for the famous or whatever standards we hold to. God's always looking for the heart. We're going to find with Gideon that his heart was right before God. Now, when we find him in our story, he's in a wine press threshing wheat. The wine press would have been deep. So on one hand, he's in the deep wine press to thresh the wheat so the Midianites, if they came by, would not see him. And if they did see him, they might think, oh, he's just doing wine. Gideon's frightened. All of Israel's frightened. Secondly, we see that he's threshing wheat in the wine press, which tells us there wasn't much food left at all if you could thresh it in a wine press. They're starving. They were frightened of the Midianites, their oppressors. And Gideon was terrified. I would be too. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, the angel of the Lord here is mistaken by Gideon as an angel. But if we read through this text, we find something very interesting. This angel speaking as if the angel's God. This is a theophany, if you will, an appearance of God. We find in this passage that uh, this one who's speaking is none other than God who will become flesh and dwell among us. That this is the word of God. That this is the one who will take on the name in the first century of Yeshua or Jesus. God is salvation. Gideon doesn't know that. That right in front of him is God. And as he cries out, God, where is God? God is standing right in front of him. God has never left. God is always with us. No matter what we go through. As soon as the angel of the Lord disappears, we find out that Gideon is frightened. Oh, now he realizes that he's seen God face to face and he's still alive. Something that's impossible. We find the angel of the Lord in other parts of the Bible in Genesis. We see the angel of the Lord speaking to Abraham. And when he speaks to Abram, Abram realizes who he really is, that this is God now with him. We'll see that the angel of the Lord is one who, who met with Moses and spoke with Moses. It's not an angel. This is God himself. And Gideon knows those stories, and he begins to realize, I'm still alive. How can this be? And he's frightened. And the sign comes from heaven to Gideon. Do not be afraid. It's all well. It's okay. Gideon said to the angel before he departed, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Where are all his wonders that the ancestors told us about? Gideon could not understand why God would allow the Midianites to raid Israel. We know because we read the story and we see their waywardness. Gideon doesn't quite understand. In his mind, the people were good. They were trying to get by. They were earning their living. They were farmers just trying to survive. And now they were under the threat of the sword. Now keep in mind, as they were under the threat of the sword, one of the famous images that will come out of this story is the sword of Gideon. We'll look at that next week. Seven years had come and gone, and the people of the land were starving. Why did God allow this? Where was God? Gideon, look in front of you. He's right there. Now, sometimes I wonder, God, where are you in this? Where are you, God? When I see tragedy happen in this life or things that are in unjust, I often cry out, God, where are you? And then later I realize God was already there. God never left. God was with us. I would be filled with doubt and insecurity had I been Gideon, and so he was. I would have asked God for a sign or several signs, as Gideon did. I'm the weakest of my clan, the weakest tribe, Lord, Gideon replied. I can't do this. But if I found favor with your, within your eyes, verses 17 and 18, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And Gideon made some food as an offering. 
Much like Abraham and Sarai, or Ab- Abram and Sarai in Genesis will go and make food to speak to the angel of the Lord. Now Gideon provides food. And what's interesting about Gideon's provision of food is this. He goes off, tells the angel, please stay here, and the Lord stays. And he makes a goat. He boils a goat. He brings broth and a cake of bread. The size of the offering is enormous. And I want you to note this because it was costly. Remember, Gideon's living in poverty. This is one of the reasons I believe Gideon may have been chosen by God to do mighty things. Because Gideon's heart was to say, look, I don't have anything. I, have, I don't have much at all, but I'm giving much. And in giving much to God, he was showing his faith. Are your offerings to God costly? Offerings are powerful when they are sacrificial. We often spend our time in honoring God by tipping God. But God admires those who have the courage to make costly offerings to God. God, this is for you. I don't have it. I'm going to give you what I have. Jesus would commend a widow in his day who gave her last two pennies. God's going to take care of her. I love the first thing about that image that he gave a sacrificial offering. Secondly, I love the fact that the Lord waited Just as the angel of the Lord waited when Abram and Sarai went off to make their meal, God waited on Gideon. God's patience is beyond anything that we've ever experienced. And Gideon took the food and put it on a rock and poured the broth on it as instructed. And immediately the Lord took a tip of his staff, touched it, and fire came from the rock, burned it up, and God left. Imagine that. All of that preparation for that split-second moment. What we read in the story is this. Gideon prepared himself for the sign. Sometimes I believe we miss the signs of God around us because God, give me a sign. And then as as God does something, we go back to our lives and wander away. And yet our life of faith is to be such that we are prepared to look for those signs of God. Are you prepared to see God and hear God and hear what God has to say? You'll need to focus on the Lord's work at hand. You'll need to prepare your life to meet the Lord. Many people want signs, but there are a few who line up their lives in obedience to God. We want signs for the moment. Gideon was given signs to strengthen his work for the Lord. Gideon, a mighty man of God, was frightened. He lacked faith. He needed encouragement, and so God gave him a sign and then another sign to encourage him We find in the New Testament another person, and you can read his story, the Apostle Paul, and we find out this great man of faith who conquered the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ was very frightened himself too. We find that Paul has sign after sign after sign in his life because he just doesn't know, Lord, how do I do this? It's not my strength, God, it's by your grace. We find Jesus appearing to him in the road to Damascus. We see that scales fell from his eyes so he could see again. We see the apostle Paul one night waking up with Jesus standing there by his bedside. We see another time where where he's told that the ship that he's on will sink, but not to worry, you be the one to help the others. Not to worry, this won't lead to destruction. Sign after sign after sign for the apostle Paul. Why? Because he was like you and me, insecure, God, where are you? I'm trying to get through this thing called faith. And God says, hold my hand. Hold my hand. I'll get you through. And when we earnestly call out to God, not for a sign to get us to the next moment to forget the Lord, but when we earnestly cry out, God, give me affirmation so that I can do your work, God provides signs for us and encouragements. Signs are God's way of offering us something we could already know but our doubts and insecurities get in the way. God doesn't answer our why questions, but he understands we need help. Gideon struggled with God, and if we read on in the book of Judges, we see that God sends Gideon. The very first thing he's to do after having this encounter with the angel of the Lord is to go in and destroy the images and the idols, and they're found in Gideon's father's fields. There's Baal and the Asherah pole. 
And Gideon goes in at night because he was afraid, the scriptures say. He's still timid and fearful. He brings a couple of his friends and they tear down the idols. And the next morning, there's a knock on his door. And the men of the city say, bring out Gideon. We're angry with him. How could he do this? He must die for destroying Baal and Ashtoreth. And Gideon's father had enough wisdom to say, really, do you have to contend for a God? Let that God contend with my son Gideon, or let my son contend with a God. And so there Gideon's name was changed, Jerubal, Jerubal, which means one who strives with Baal, and he will strive against Baal time and time again. Why? Because he's a man of faith. He's a person of faith. And friends, if we are to follow God, we will strive against the gods of this world and the injustices that are around us. That's the story of Gideon. This man who's humble, hu humble and humbly asking God for help. God has chosen because of his dedication and sacrifice, his humility to defeat the gods of this world that enslave people and the injustices that are all around us. And that's our work, friends, to be people like Gideon, to see God's hand of miracle upon us so we can destroy those false gods that enslave other people. In all of my experiences of signs in my life, I've come to the realization that the miraculous signs that we may experience are not always the most powerful. I want to end the message today by saying the two signs that I love most dearly in my life, that when I struggle, God, where are you? Where are we going? What am I supposed to do? God, did I make the right decision? The two signs that I need desperately are these. The first one is, God puts the sign of Barnabases in my life. These are people who are encouragers. God, where are you? And people come up and say, God is with you. Don't give up. Boy, we need Barnabases in the church today. We need people who will stand as signs of God to say, I'm with you. God is with you. You can go. You can do this. I love to come to church because that's where I find my Barnabases in this fellowship, in this community. The second sign Oh, before I give you the second sign, I, I'm reminded of the Duke of Wellington. He was a British military leader who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. He was not an easy man to serve under. He was brilliant, he was demanding, and he was never one to shower his subordinates with compliments. At the end of his life, a lady came to him and said, look, if you could do your life differently, would you do something differently? He said, yes. If I had to live my life over again, he said, and I quote, I would give more praise because he saw that as one of the keys of life, giving praise to others, encouraging others, inspiring others. And the second sign, and I'll end with this, that I treasure more than the supernatural ones, though they both come from the Holy Spirit, all signs come from God's Spirit, are the markers that are set up for me along the path of life. I like to look back to see God's hand, where God's hand has been upon me, because God's signs are much easier to read looking back than at the moment, aren't they? When Wednesday night, we're studying the prophet Samuel. The people of Israel, he calls together one day. He assembles all of the people of Israel, and they put up a stone. And the stone is a stone of remembrance. And the word that's used for there is Ebenezer. And these Ebenezer, this Ebenezer set up as a marker to remind the people, thus far has God brought me. And in my life, as I look at the things that have happened, I need those markers to say, this is my Ebenezer. Thus far God has brought me. Put up another one. Thus far God has brought me. Thus far God has brought me. And those are signs to me as I look back at my life. God was with me. And as I look back at my life, I begin to realize why am I still fearful today? Why do I have insecurities and doubts today after all that God has done in my life? And maybe you're the same way. Maybe today you need an encouragement. You need to know to be, that you can be strong and courageous because God is calling you to go and defeat the gods, enslaving others, and the injustices of this world. Be strong and courageous as you look back in your life because you'll see where God has been. And if God has been there, why would God not be with you?
the day. Amen? Let's pray. God, as we look at the story of Gideon, there's much to be grateful for. We thank you that this humble man, the weakest of his tribe and the weakest tribe, as we'll see next week, will conquer the vast armies of oppression because God was with him. Lord, help us not to look for signs as the end all, but to receive your affirmations that we can go forward doing your work. Bless us, Lord, so we can bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 915 and 1115. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.